Hey, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you. I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into God's word. I also hope that you have some community around you that you can talk through some of these things with. And I wanna remind you that we are in the middle of our year in the story, which is really this deep dive into God's great story and our place in it. If you'd like more information about that or about our community here at Restore, you can get that all on our website at restoreaustin.org. We really would love to see you soon. Thanks. This is the story of God with us. Uh, I get asked a lot of times to, um, like, what's the Bible about? What's, what's the story? If, if I had to summarize it quickly, how, how would I put it? Now, I'll tell you, if I had to summarize the story of the Bible in 30 seconds, here's what I would say. Number one, it tells the story of God who is unbelievably powerful, glorious, mighty, and good. He's the one true God, creator and sustainer of all things. He is different and better than any other thing imaginable. Number two, this amazing God created us and he created us in his image. But not only did he create us and create us in his image, his desire is to be an intimate relationship with us. And finally, number three, we keep messing that relationship up. We don't trust him, we turn our backs on him, but even when we do, he relentlessly pursues restoration with us by any means necessary. That, my friends, is, is the story of Scripture. That's the story that the Bible tells. And we see this story play out in five acts. Act one is Eden. As God creates all things and he places the first humans in this paradise, in this garden. Act two is Israel as God calls Abraham and his family out and he says, I'm going to bless you and your offspring to be a blessing to the entire world. Act three is Jesus. We see God himself put on flesh, come to earth and dwell with us, eventually laying his life down for us and rising from the dead. Act four, we have the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter two, the book of Bible, the book of the Bible called Acts chapter two, we see the Holy Spirit come down, empower the people of God, and this new thing comes out called the church. And finally, Act five, we have this new heaven and new earth. As God finishes his restoration of all things, he makes all things new. Five acts telling one story. This series we begin today called Presence, God With Us is going to spend a week on each of the first four acts. And then we'll do a deep dive into act five in a series after this one that we're calling Heaven, Hell, and Other Things We Don't Understand Very Well. I believe this series, this series about God with us is vitally important for us. It's vitally important for anyone seeking to understand what the Bible is really about. And it's also an integral part of this thing that we're calling a year in the story. So you may remember that back in August, we uh, launched this thing. We said that we were going to start this year in the story. We're going to spend the entire next year talking about God's great story and our place in it with the hope that after this year ends, we would have a really strong grasp of what story is the Bible really telling? What, what is the Bible actually trying to tell us about God, about us, and about God with us? You see, God's story and our place in it is impossible to understand if we don't understand the thread that weaves through all of Scripture, the tie that binds it all together. And this thread is the thread of God's relentless presence, of God with us, of him coming after us, of him seeking out restoration with us. That's what holds it all together. In his book called The Drama of Scripture, a guy named Craig Bartholomew explores God's story. He explores the big story and he explores our place in it. And he begins his book by lamenting what many Western Christians have done to the story told in the Bible. Here's what he says. 
Why have Christians who claim to believe the Bible not seen what treasure they have? The problem, you see, is that the Bible has been broken up into little bits, historical critical bits, devotional bits, moral bits, theological bits, and narrative bits. In fact, it's been chopped into fragments that fit into the nooks and crannies of the Western cultural story. He's saying we've made it what we want it to be. We've adapted it to us instead of adapting ourselves to it. And he says, when this is allowed to happen, the Bible forfeits its claim to be the one comprehensive true story of our world. That's what the Bible claims to be. British theologian and missionary, a guy named Leslie Newbingen, tells the story of doing missionary work in India. And during his time there, he spent a lot of time, he was in relationship with this Hindu scholar of world religions. And during their relationship, they had many conversations. And in one of his books, Leslie records something profound that this Hindu guy told him that forever changed his life. Here's what the Hindu scholar says. I can't understand why you missionaries present the Bible to us in India as a book of religion. It is not a book of religion. And anyway, we have plenty of books of religion in India. We don't need any more. I find your Bible to be a unique interpretation of universal history, the history of the whole creation and the history of the human race, and therefore a unique interpretation of the human person as a responsible actor in history. That is unique. There is nothing else in the whole religious literature of the world to put alongside it. That's the claim that the Bible makes. One grand story telling the truth about God, who he is, telling the truth about us, who we are, and telling the great story of God with us. But as Craig Bartholomew so aptly said, we often miss the treasure of Scripture because we are so busy breaking it up into little bite-sized devotional moral, historical, and theological bits. To put it another way, we've missed the story. We've missed the story. We've missed God's great, big story, and therefore we've missed our place in it. And that's why we're spending a year in the story, and that's why we're starting it, starting this series by looking at the first of these five acts of Scripture. So let's pray, and then we'll open up our great story in Act 1. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the word that you've given us. Thank you for the Scriptures. God, we know that, as Jesus said when he was here on earth, the Scriptures aren't amazing because inside of them there is life. No, they're amazing because they tell us where we can find life. That's in your son, Jesus the work that he's done for us. That's in the story of how you relentlessly pursue us. So I pray that as we open the word, as we open scriptures this morning, that you would reveal to us this story. Show us who you are. Show us who we are. Show us the way you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first three chapters of the Bible, that is Genesis 1 through 3, and the last three chapters of the Bible, Revelation 20 through 22, frame the entire biblical story. I'm going to go through some stuff. It's going to all be on the screen. If you would like to take notes, I would encourage you to do so. It's some really beautiful things I want to show you about how all of this works together. You see, one of the biggest pieces of feedback I receive from people as I'm having coffee or hanging out or pastoring folks, they, they always say, how do I understand the Bible? Like, where do I start? What do I start reading? How do I understand it? I read this passage, it doesn't make sense. I read this other passage, it doesn't seem like they go together well. Is there a big story? Is is there a way to understand this? So that's really what I'm going to try to unpack with you this morning. So if you'd like to take some notes, I would encourage you to do that. So the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 through 3, and the last three chapters, Revelation 20 through 22, as I said, they frame the entire biblical story. Not only are they the bookends of the actual physical Bible, they frame the entire story. So if you were here, you know that we just spent an entire four-week series on Genesis 1 through 3. But I want to break it down for us quickly just by chapter, okay? So chapter 1 is the creation of Eden. So we see in, in six days the world is created. On the seventh day, God rests. 
We see this whole creation of the world and then creation specifically of Eden, the place where God puts Adam and Eve. Chapter two, we see the creation of humanity. It really focuses in on human beings being created by God and how they're created, how they're in his image and how they're made from the ground and how God breathes life into their lungs. That's chapter two. Then chapter three, we see the temptation of Satan in the form of the serpent. He comes before Adam and Eve. Many of us know the story. He tempts them and they choose not to trust God. They choose to turn their backs on him and we see the fall of humanity. We see sin enter into the world. As the first three chapters of the Bible. That's the beginning of our story. Here's the end, Revelation 20 through 22. <clears throat> Chapter 20 is the judgment of Satan. Chapter 21 is the restoration of humanity. Chapter 22 is the restoration of Eden. Pretty cool how those work together. I want to explain it for you. Chapter 20, Revelation, verses one through three summarize it. Here's what it says. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, listen, that ancient serpent, it's talking about Satan here, who is the devil or Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He threw them into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. That ancient serpent from Genesis 3 is dealt with here to prevent him from deceiving people anymore. Judgment of Satan. He's defeated by God once and for all. That's Revelation 20. Revelation 21, look at verses three through five. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making everything new. Chapter 21 is the restoration of humanity. We are made new. The tears are wiped from our eyes. The brokenness that sin brought into the world, the pain that sin brought into the world is forever dealt with here. And then finally, chapter 22, we see the restoration of Eden. In fact, the subheading at the very beginning of chapter 22 in most of your Bibles literally says, Eden restored. Here's what verses one through three say. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. See, humanity is welcomed back to these trees of life the tree of life that Adam and Eve were banished from. There is no longer any curse that came about in Genesis 3. Eden is restored. Paradise, perfection is restored. This final act in God's story also describes a new temple. And this is really important. God's dwelling place with humanity. You see, this perfect and final version of the temple is God with us, fully realized. But it isn't a temple in the traditional sense. It's actually an entire city. You see, John, the author of the book of Revelation, describes it like this in chapter 21, starting in verse 10. It says, he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. He goes on to talk more about the beauty of the city, the gold, the precious stones, the architecture, how incredible it is. And then he says something that has become one of my very favorite passages in all of scripture. Verse 22 I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp, the Lamb here referring to Jesus. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. My friends, this is the fully restored creation of God. 
his perfect dwelling place for us and for him. It's the Garden of Eden, but without the temptation of Satan, without the devastation of sin. This final temple is the culmination of God's presence with his people. It's the apex of God with us. You may have noticed this already, but I want to put it on the screen again so we can fully see the picture. Revelation 20 and 22 reverses the devastation of Genesis 1 through 3. Look at that. Genesis 1, the creation of Eden, the first chapter. The last chapter is the restoration of Eden. The second chapter is the creation of humanity. The 21st chapter, the second to last chapter, is the restoration of humanity. The third chapter is the temptation of Satan and the fall of humanity. Chapter 20 is the judgment of Satan. God is reversing the curse. He is restoring all things. Isn't that beautiful? The stuff that broke in the first three chapters is fully restored in the last three chapters. God and humanity are finally and fully dwelling together. This picture of a temple-like dwelling place between God and humanity has been God's plan all along. This is what he's shooting for. This is what he's about, dwelling with us in perfection. So the question becomes, how did we stray so far away from that? Why did it take the entire story of human history to get us from Genesis 1 through 3 to Revelation 20 through 22? Well, it all started with a violation of the first temple back in Genesis 1 through 3. Now, you see, it may not look like it at first glance, but God created the world in Genesis 1 through 3 as a temple, as a place to dwell with us. And if we know what to look for, we see this vividly in the creation account. These are things that would have been obvious to the original audience, to the ancient Near Eastern Hebrews who first heard this story or read this story. But because of the time and place gap between us and them, we have to work a little bit harder to see this as a temple. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you that doing the work to see this is so worth it. It's so worth it because honestly, for me, understanding God's big truth in scripture, his big story that we've been walking through, it has enriched my faith, faith as much as anything else. It is changed, it's changed me, I'm, I'm honest with you. It's deepened my faith and my understanding of who God is and who we are and how he relentlessly pursues us with his love. It's been an amazing and beautiful thing. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We're going to spend the rest of our time together in Genesis 1 through 3. So you can go ahead and turn there, or the verses will also be on the screen behind me. So one of the easiest signs of creation as a temple is found in Genesis 3. You see, verse 24 tells us that the entrance to the Garden of Eden is through the east. But because of the rising and setting sun, most other sanctuaries housing the presence of God also have their entrances through the east. This is a very common thing. So when humanity is kicked out of the garden, they go out and it says that God places the angel at the entrance at the east. That's one way of him saying this is a temple because temples have their entrances in the east. This was true all throughout scripture, including the tabernacle built by Moses and the temple built by Solomon. All had their entrances in the east. Another one is found in Genesis 3.8. So it says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking about in the garden in the cool of the day. Walking about, emphasis on that phrase. You see, this, the way this verse describes God as walking about in the garden is the exact same Hebrew phrase used to describe God's presence in the temple sanctuary. It's the exact same phrase. God walking about in the garden is described the exact same way as God walking about, moving about in the temple. This is in Leviticus 26, in Deuteronomy 23, and in 2 Samuel 7. This same phrase about God's presence in the temple is used. Next, we have this picture of Adam and Eve as these archetypal priests in the temple. In Genesis 2.15, we see God's assignment for humanity in the Garden of Eden. It says, to work it and take care of it. He placed them there to work it and take care of it. The only other occurrence of this Hebrew phrase used to describe the job given to humanity in this verse is in the book of Numbers. And it describes the duties of the Levite priests in the temple sanctuary. They were to work it and take care of it. 
That's what it says. That was the job of the priests in the temple. It was Adam and Eve's job as the priests of the first temple to work it and to take care of it. Now, a huge indicator that this is a temple for God to dwell with humanity is found in the connection to the tabernacle. Now, if you don't know what the tabernacle is, it's basically this portable temple for God built by the Hebrew people in the book of Exodus under the leadership of Moses. Let me show you some of these. These are really incredible. The language connections from the beginning of Genesis 2, they're they're really quite stunning. So the first one is Genesis 2.1. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed. Then Exodus 39, 32, about the tabernacle. Thus, all the work on the tabernacle was completed. Next, you have Genesis 2, 2. It says, God had finished the work. Exodus 40, 33, so Moses finished the work. Next, Genesis 2, 3, it says, then God blessed and made it holy. Exodus 39 and 40, so Moses blessed and it was holy. It's not just the English translations here that are strikingly similar. The original Hebrew phrases are the same. They're the same. The way that it talks about the temple in Eden is the same way that it talks about the tabernacle. It's it's really incredible. The creation building process also mirrors the tabernacle building process. So listen, just like there are six days of creation in Genesis 1, there are six commands of instruction for building the tabernacle. Six and six. Just like on the seventh day of creation, God rests on the seventh day of dedicating the temple, in the tabernacle, God comes to rest inside of it. Incredible. This isn't the only emphasis on the number seven. Now listen to this. I'll be honest, we're gonna nerd out for a second, okay? Like this is gonna get intense. But I want you to see how cool, and, and here's the important thing, how purposeful these Bible passages really are. They are attempting to tell us something important. Sevens are everywhere. The number seven is everywhere throughout Genesis 1 through 3. Genesis 1-1 contains seven words in Hebrew. Genesis 1-2 has 14 words, seven times two if you're struggling with math. Furthermore, significant words in this passage occur in all multiples of seven. And it was so, which is said after every day of creation, occurs seven times. God saw that it was good occurs seven times. The earth, the word earth occurs 21 times. The word heaven occurs 21 times. The word God occurs 35 times. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 references the seventh day seven times in three separate sentences, each containing seven words. I'm not making this up. You can check. This is real. Genesis 2, 1 through 3, the seventh day, seven times in three sentences of seven words. These are not coincidences. This is all purposefully and masterfully done by the author. You see, he is working very hard to show us and the original audience something very important, not only about this passage, but about who God is, about what his purpose is for us. The focus on the number seven serves two main purposes. Number one, we talked about this a lot in the series on Eden, but it shows the perfection of God's creation, perfection of God. Number seven is used all throughout scripture to represent fullness and perfection. That's number one. But number two, it highlights the apex of the creation story. That is the seventh day. You know why that's the apex of the creation story? Because it's when God comes to rest in his temple with humanity. Because that's the purpose. The purpose is not making the fish. The purpose is not separating the water and the land. The purpose is not even making you and I in his image. The purpose is him with us. That's the climax. That's the apex. That is the story. God with us. So we have the temple of the whole world in Eden. We have the portable temple of the tabernacle. Later, we see the temple that Solomon builds for God in Jerusalem. And guess what? The importance of the number seven carries over into Solomon's temple as well. See, actually, let me say this one more thing about the tabernacle. It's very important. It's pretty cool. (laughs) Seven days of creation culminating with God's rest among the people in the garden. For the tabernacle, seven days of consecration culminating with God's rest among his people in the tabernacle. 
Seven days culminating in God with us. Seven days culminating in God with us. We see it in Eden. We see it in the tabernacle. Now, this number seven carries over to Solomon's temple as well. You see, the dedication of Solomon's temple occurs during the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a seven-day festival that occurred on the seventh month of the year. We also know that Solomon's temple took seven years to complete. And in Leviticus 25, that seventh year is called the Sabbath year. It takes seven years to complete. The seventh year is a Sabbath year. Genesis 1 shows creation in seven days with the seventh day being the Sabbath, the day that God comes to rest with us. The symbolism here is both beautiful and undeniable. God is making a temple to dwell with humanity. That's the purpose. Put it another way, God is making a home for him and his kids. That's what he's doing. That's what the earth is. It's a broken home right now, but it wasn't always, and it won't always be. It's a place for him to dwell with us. This understanding really magnifies the way we read and understand the creation account, especially in Genesis 1. So in this series we just wrapped up called Eden, we talked at length about how this passage, Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible, is an elevation of God as the one true God. He's the God over all other deities worshipped in the ancient Near East by the Egyptians and the Babylonians and all these other people. It's, it's elevating him, saying he is the one true God. He is better and greater than all of these other gods. But in addition to that, we see here that Genesis 1 is also a celebration of the temple that God is building to dwell with his people. We pointed this out in week one of our Eden series, but this creation account is bookended by Genesis 1, 1 through 2, and a conclusion in Genesis 2, 1 through 3. So you don't have to look closely to see that the six days are paired up as well. Look at it, it's on the screen behind me. So you have Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 2, 1 and 3, thus the heavens and the earth were completed. And then you have them paired up, right? So you have day one, light, day four, lights. Day two, sky and sea. Day five, birds of the air and fish in the sea, the things that live in the sky and in the sea. Day three, land and plants. Day six, humanity and animals. It's a very purposefully structured and put together thing. The author even makes each of the days rhythmic and melodious. The first thing he does is he starts each one with the phrase, and God said, and in the middle of each one, it has the phrase, it was good, and then he finishes each one with, there was evening and there was morning. It's this rhythmic, melodious, it's like a song. It's like a, a celebration of God's temple. It's a beautifully written, highly structured passage. It honestly, it has the feel of a hymn or a liturgy used in a worship service. And in fact, this passage has been used in thousands of hymns and thousands of worship songs and liturgical readings over the 2,000-year history of the church. It's one of the passages that is most often made into hymns and liturgies and songs. To say it another way, Genesis 1 is a dedication song for God's temple. One he knew would, everybody would sing his people would sing for thousands of years. Genesis 1 is God's declaration to all humanity and to all of the world for all time that his intention and his desire is to dwell with us. He's announcing that. The very first page of the Bible is God announcing to us and to everyone that his intention is to be with us, to dwell with us. And that, my friends, is why all of this matters so much. That's why it's worth nerding out a little bit. That's why it's worth doing the work to see. Because what we have here is the clearest picture of God's desire for his world. And listen, it's just the beginning of God with us. It's just the start. Because we all know what happens to this temple in Genesis 3. Humanity breaks it. But that didn't stop God. Because us breaking temples never stops God. Remember the Bible in 30 seconds that I, I shared back at the beginning? Right, number one, God is unbelievably powerful and glorious. He's better than every other thing. Number two, he made us in his image and his desire is to be in an intimate relationship with us. Number three, we keep messing that relationship up, but he keeps coming after us. 
That's the 30 second version. Here's the five second version of what the Bible is about. God creates a temple to dwell with us and we break it. God creates another temple to dwell with us and we break it. God creates another temple to dwell with us and we break it on and on and on. He keeps making temples and we keep messing them up. We keep breaking them, but my friends, he keeps making them. We just sang about it. He relentlessly pursues us with his love. There is no wall he won't tear down, kick down. There's no lie he won't tear down. Coming after us. This is the story. This is the story. God's great story. And it all started back in Genesis chapter one. I really love the way that uh, author Rachel Held Evans puts it. She says, the creation account of Genesis 1, in which God brings order to the cosmos and makes it a temple, is meant to remind the people of Israel, and by extension, us, that God needs no building of stone from which to reign, but dwells in every landscape, and in the presence of the humble, he will make a home. Should all other identities or securities be thrown into tumult, should nations be fractured and temples torn down, this truth remains. God is with us and God is for us. It's a story as true now as it was then. No matter what happens, no matter how many temples we break, God is for us and God is with us. And our hope, my friends, our hope is found in Jesus, the one who came as a temple. We'll look in week three of this series. It literally says in John chapter one that Jesus took on flesh and came and tabernacled with us. He templed with us. He came to dwell with us. But our hope doesn't even stop there. Our hope is also found in those last three chapters of Scripture where the temple is not just a structure, it's an entire city where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit dwell there with us, where there are trees of life and rivers of flowing water and there is no sin, there is no tears, there is no pain, there is no sorrow anymore. There are no more broken families. There's no more poverty. There's no more systematic injustice. There's no more slavery. There's no more pain. There's no more brokenness. There is only us and him in perfection. And it all started back in Genesis 1 when he built that first temple to be with us. We knew his intentions then, and I'm telling you that they have not changed. And I'm also telling you that no matter who you are or what you've done, he still wants that with you. Isn't that incredible? That's what Joe shared, right, at the very beginning here. When we think about all the grace that I, just I need, right, just Joe needs, just that, that you and I need, we think, God, you must be maxed out. But not only does he have enough grace for us, he's got enough grace for us in this room. He's got enough grace for our nation. He's got enough grace for every nation of all peoples who have ever lived or who will live. He is coming after us relentlessly pursuing this intimate relationship with us, no matter what walls he has to kick down, no matter what lies he has to tear down. His purpose is God with us. And that's how we're gonna end the first message in this series this morning. So the band is gonna come back up and we're gonna sing a song called God with us. And as we do, I want you to take the next few minutes and I want you to just really meditate on these words. I don't care if you stand and sing. I don't care if you sit down and just read the words that are on the screen or if you kneel and pray or if you walk over to the prayer area. I'm gonna stand right there with some of our prayer team. If you wanna go and pray with us, we would love to do that with you. I don't care how you do it. But ask God to move in you. Ask him to really reveal his purpose. That is him with you. And then listen to me really, really closely and carefully. And I'm telling you this, and it may be a hard truth to hear, but I want you to ask and pray 
What am I doing like Adam and Eve to turn my back on God's attempt to dwell with me? Am I running from him? Am I not trusting in him? What am I scared of? What's holding me back? Because I'm telling you that I have experienced the fullness of God with us as much as we can in this broken world. And there is nothing like it. And I want that for you. So look, I don't know what's holding you back this morning. I don't know what's getting in the way. I don't know what you're afraid of. I don't know what is in between God's chasing after you and you just turning around and saying, I'm here. I don't know what it is. But I know, I know that God wants to tear it down. I know because he wants to be with you. Because he doesn't want all your good works. He doesn't want some ability that you have. He doesn't want anything (laughs) except you. He wants your heart. He wants you to know him and to love him. And I want that for you. I do. So let me pray. Like I said, I'm going to be right over there. If you want to pray with someone, the band's going to lead us in this song. God, thank you for the truth of your story. Thank you that from opening page to closing page in the scriptures that you have revealed yourself to us in, that you are coming after us. You relentlessly build temples to be with us. You create homes for you and your kids. That's who you are. That's what you're about. And you have never let anything get in the way of that, God. But in that same moment, you still allow us the choice to run away, to break it down, to turn our backs, or to just turn and be enveloped by your love. So I pray this morning for those of us maybe who have never turned and received your love, or who have received it before but have just stopped living in it. I pray that that would change this morning. God, like the prodigal son, it's not that we clean ourselves up and come home and pay all of the things back that we've done wrong, God. The moment we turn around and head for home, you are running toward us. You are picking us up. You are hugging us. You are kissing us. You are throwing the biggest party imaginable for us. You are coming after us. Help us meet you there this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.